lens of, I don't know what it is. Last week's gospel was the selective bookend that surround Mark's telling of the feeding of the 5,000. But this week, we get John's actual telling of that story. Along with that Sunday school picture book story, we find things like an attempt at forced king making. Oh, and not to move along too quickly, we'll just throw in Jesus walking on water and maybe the Holy Spirit acting like an autopilot for a boat trip. <laughs> no big deal, I can handle this, no worries. More seriously, the confusion that might overtake us when we encounter a passage of Scripture that is this dense is very real. So let's take some time to look around and notice where we are in the Bible. From last week to this one, we jumped from the Gospel of Mark, the earliest one written that was used by the other writers of Luke and Matthew to help them write their Gospels, to John which is different in both tone and origin from the other three Gospels. John was written by a community of Gentiles who were living at least one full generation after the life of Jesus. Theologies about who Jesus is and beliefs about what it means to follow him have grown and solidified. At the time, the situation of the Johannine community is one surrounded by mysticisms from Greek, Roman, and North African cultures. They're having to distinguish themselves from followers of other sons of a god like Hercules, not to mention distinguishing themselves from the Jewish communities around them as well. The writers of the Gospel of John are doing the work of establishing what it means to be a Christian through comparison and contrast. Let's join them and maybe see what they're getting. Eating is an act of hope and life. Eating together with other people knits us more closely to them. In this feeding story, Jesus doesn't ask people who they are, or, you know, just have them all sit down, like one big family. He doesn't ask them what they believe, or if they like or hate him. He doesn't ask them what their politics are, or who their parents were, or refuse even to give them food because they're sinful. What Jesus offers goes to everyone, and they are all satisfied with what they get. To the Johannine community, this is a message about who they should welcome into their family to receive the meal of the Eucharist, and whether or not they themselves get to be included in the people that Jesus loved. And they do, because Jesus namely, loves everyone. Then there's that amount, 12 baskets collected, so as not to waste them. 12 is a number of completeness in Hebrew, and this is about how God orders the world. So 12 being complete, that's an amount left over that's enough to feed still more people completely. Twelve is also a number of the tribes of Israel, which casts the community that gathered and sat in the grass for this feeding in the light of being the people of God through association with that symbolic number. The Johannine community might see this as there being room for them, Gentiles, in the love that God has for creation, and not even second-hand, but really full inclusion as part of the people of God. Now there's this part where the people see Jesus as powerful 
and the leader. So they want to make him their king. This connects to that story of how God's people got kings in the first place by anointing Saul, who turned out to be not great. So they anointed David, who also turned out to not be great, but at least he was a man who was driven by his faith when he was at his best. But Jesus isn't like that either. He isn't a worldly leader. The Johannine community needs to hear that Jesus isn't a failed revolutionary or a wannabe king. He had his chance to go that route more than once, perhaps, and rejected. So Jesus is something other than a king, or maybe more than a king. He's more than a prophet, too. No prophet walks on water to get to the boat he missed. The message of love, inclusion, and hope that Jesus teaches is one that travels seemingly by God's given power, taking these boats exactly where they want to go, or did they? And it is. The acts and effects of the Holy Spirit are real in this story in a way the Johannine community needs to hear about. They have probably felt their own heart moved by God's love and want to know if that same Holy Spirit was acting in and around Jesus' life too. And here they see a report of these are the sorts of lessons and connections and deep beliefs being brought up in today's gospel to establish what it is to be a Christian in a world that is not like being Christian. I'm often grateful that different communities wrote the gospel. The ability to look back at the faith of my religious forebearers who have had their own perspectives and recognize the sorts of questions that they once had are the same as the ones I've had during different points in my life. And each of them offers answers appropriate to themselves and their situation. It makes me want to sit down with them over a cup of coffee or maybe share a meal. To hear their stories and to share my own. I would gladly break off a piece of my loaf and pass it along so that others can eat and be satisfied. In humility, I would also gladly accept whatever got passed to me. Food, Stories of the light I've never tasted before, but still find good. When we come to the Eucharist on Sunday mornings, this is a part of what we are doing. Breaking bread in ancient ways, everyone being welcomed and being fed. The scripture and soul. Love. This table that we now turn to is a part of building a community into one family.